Well, I don't know about you, but it, it seems sometimes, especially when our family gathers, that I have uh, spent a lifetime correcting grammar. And uh, from time to time, uh, I, I will do that, and that's become it's seemingly uh, my role at family gatherings. There's something about bad grammar that uh, just seems to uh, get at me in a deep way. All that being said, there are those times when certain phrases, certain slang words just reach so deep inside of us that they express something that, well, a more polite or genteel way of saying it might not cut it. Why, who among us hasn't used the word ain't? When we're really passionate about something, well, we ain't going to do. Ain't no way, we'll say. Ain't no how. Well, I wonder if the writer of Hebrews and all of his lifting up of what Christ has done might have echoed the sentiments of uh, a child, perhaps, in, in using that word, ain't. Or maybe describing something small and in looking for the, the greatest way to express that would say, this is the most littlest. Well, the writer of Hebrews might have used the phrase way more better to describe what we have in Christ. What Jesus has done. For in fact, he says in a number of places, this is still more excellent. This is a better way, a greater way. And he perhaps might say in our parlance, this is way more better. What Christ has done supersedes, he says, all that has passed for worship, albeit in God's direction in times past. And he goes into great detail about the, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, all of the fixtures, all of the ritual associated with the worship of Yahweh in times past. With his ancestors who came before God, seeking God, seeking to be right with God. Seeking a sacrifice that would set aside their sins and allow them access to God. And he speaks about Jesus being the ultimate high priest. How all of these things are, are a shadow of what truly is. And he comes to this great passage and he says, Jesus is the high priest of the good things that have come through a greater and more perfect way. He reaches a crescendo at the end and he says, and now Jesus has offered himself through the eternal spirit without blemish to God so that you and I might purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. But how is it that Christ's sacrifice is way more better, if you will, why on a day like today, we might be attuned to all the practical matters of what that was like. To how inconvenient it might have been to round up a goat or a heifer and travel some distance. Not only was it cumbersome and inconvenient, but, but gruesome and time-consuming. <laughs> but that's really not what the writer of Hebrews is after. He's not just telling us this is something that's easier and more convenient. He's really saying this is, if you will, way more better because of what it achieves, because of what it grants us, what it gives us, what it does for us as those who would gather to worship God. So how is it that Christ, the perfect high priest, the perfect sacrifice, this new level of worshiping God is better than what has come. Well, he says, first of all, in Christ, God is better able to bless us. God can bless us more powerfully in spiritual ways than he might have our ancestors who worship God by all of these visible external rituals. Have you ever wondered why the scriptures are so full of God inviting 
his people, and in fact all creation, to worship him. Why, initially it might sound as if God is on some sort of ego trip. God simply desires our attention, wants to hear from us as some ruler might, how great he is. But that's not all why God bids us worship. It might be akin to uh, a parent telling a child not to do something or to do something. What's the motivation behind that? I don't know any well-meaning parent who would say to someone else, perhaps another adult, watch me get this young person to do what I want and to somehow take pleasure in that. That might be the case with some evil despot throughout history, but that's not what a loving parent does. We know as parents and grandparents that, that our child or grandchild's well-being may very well depend on them completing something that we would direct or doing something that we would ask them to do or not do. It's for them that we would give a command, as it were. And so it is with God. God commands our worship not so that he can simply derive some egotistical pleasure in what we might offer, but God asks for our worship because he knows that in the midst of our worship is tremendous blessing. It's what we were created to do. It's where we find our purpose. It's where we find God's blessing. And the writer of Hebrews says, in Christ, our worship has more power, greater potential for God to bless us. And so God says, here is a better way. Here is a greater way. Not for my benefit, but for yours. God, as we worship in Christ, is better able and more powerfully to bless us. But that's not all. God is also able in Christ to dwell with us and within us. The writer of Hebrews says that it was through the, the ashes of a heifer, the blood of goats and bulls, that sanctify those who had been defiled so that their flesh might be purified so that they might be purified and able to approach God even from a distance. But he also tells us in Christ that here is a living way. Here is an ultimate sacrifice that continues to live even though he once was dead. Here is a way in which God through his spirit is able to dwell with us in a greater way. Not simply pardon us from a distance, but to dwell with us and in us. The indwelling of God's Holy Spirit is ours through the sacrifice of Christ. God is able to dwell with us and in us in this still greater way. Not only is God able to bless us and dwell with us, but listen to this. He says that God is able to assure us of his mercy and pardon. It says in times past, worshipers, but they, they might not be quite sure that everything was done to a T. Now, we do that in ordinary ways throughout our lives, right? Have you ever gotten in the car and wondered if you had really locked the door and you had to go back and check it and, and you weren't quite sure? And we do that in a thousand ways throughout our day. I, I wonder if I really did this. I wonder if so-and-so really understood what I meant. I wonder if I really communicated what I wanted to communicate. I wonder if this is really the case. And so it was in ancient times. How could a worshiper be sure that everything was done to a T? How could we be sure that God had really pardoned? Oh, yes, faith was involved. Was something lacking in one's assurance, not on God's side, but on our side. Had everything been done properly? And he says, listen, all that can be laid to rest because you can be assured that Christ is the perfect sacrifice without blemish before God. He has come as the perfect high priest and he has entered 
a tabernacle not made with hands, but the greater and more perfect tent in the heavenlies, of which all these other things were a mere shadow. He has obtained for us eternal redemption. You can be assured, he said, that everything is done perfectly. There need no be, be no hesitation. There need be no wondering, no second guessing. It is all done. God is able to assure us in Christ that all is well. It is perfect. It is eternal. It is once for all. So listen, he says, in this better way, in this more perfect way that Christ has accomplished, God is able to bless us more powerfully. God is able to dwell with us in a greater way and within us. God is able to assure us of his mercy and his love. And finally, God is able to transform us. What had been was external. What is now is internal. And it's God in Christ who can change and perfect us so that the law is written on our hearts. God's law of love. Through this, he says, we are purified in our conscience, in our inner person. Through this, we are fit for service, and through this, God is glorified. He says, this is the best of all. This is greater than anything that our ancestors might imagine. All of it foreshadowed, and yet it is found fulfillment in Christ. Friends, we worship God today, not in an imperfect way, not wondering, not second-guessing, not at a distance, not in a merely external way. But through Christ, all that he has done, all that he has completed perfectly, God is able to bless us most powerfully. God is able to dwell with us and in us. God is able to give us assurance of his love. And God is able to transform us through this very Christ who has led us to the innermost place of worshiping God. I wonder if in a moment seeking to express all that was in his heart and mind, the writer of Hebrews might have given vent to an expression that we might use. In Christ, things are way more better. Amen.